Good morning, genealogy friends. That was a whole lot easier than last week on YouTube. And I needed to share my screen and it turned out I needed to download something and then it wasn't downloading and then my whole computer wanted to update. It was a hot mess. So we are on Instagram today and I'm happy for it. Um, and I can see people that have joined. I'm hoping that I can also see your comments. I was just checking on the computer, but I think we're okay. How are you guys? Good morning. Do I have a poor connection? I hope not. Um, so for those of you who didn't join the first live Q&A that we had a couple weeks ago over on Facebook, it really is just an hour for you to ask questions and for us to chat. I brought books today to show, you know, just in the good morning, just in the, the downtime. But yeah, if you have any questions about anything related to family tree notebooks, um, this is your time. I can't ask, I can't answer specific questions like about each person's order. If you have a question about your order, then you need to email me at carly at familytreenotebooks.com and I will get back to you. But if you have just general questions about how it works or ideas for something, then ask away. I'm trying to think, what did we talk about last week? We talked about, or two weeks ago, we talked about how new pages are gonna come out in 2023 and I said that new pages will come out once a month and they came out last week for January. So you can find them if you go to single pages and sort from new to old or if you have bought access to one of the color folders which gets you access to all of the genealogy pages I've ever created or will create in one color, um, then you can just go to that folder and there's gonna be a subfolder called New Pages 2023 and they're already in there. Okay, so, can I flip, is that flip? Yes, okay. I brought three of my family books. Um, if you caught FTN TV, you saw that I have my family trees in books that have different covers. So I, bought, I brought three of them. It's funny because they are, um, different levels of complete these ones at least um so you're going to see that some of them have been updated to the two page spread and then some of them i still need to work on but let's jump in um this is the chinese side of my family which i feel like we see kind of often so well we can start with that it won't take long to flip through it and then we'll move on to the others um i do have to skip the earliest generations just because there's living people Please hold. Okay. And we will just do a flip through. This is one of the books that has been recently updated to two page spreads, which I really like. I wasn't sure about it at first because when I first started making these books, all of mine were just one page at a time, but it is easier to read and follow, especially because these disc bound books, uh, they're just kind of large. And so it also, of course, cuts down on how thick the book is. This is my great grandmother who was an orphan or who was adopted as a baby. So we don't know almost anything about her birth. But with DNA help, I am working on it. Um, it was a sort of scandalous thing. She was a white baby placed with Chinese people. And then there was a court case because they decided that uh, it was child cruelty to be in a foster home with Chinese parents. And so they removed her and put her in an orphanage. This orphanage, the Cameron House in San Francisco. Um, you can see I'm using, so like I've got the orphanage page here. And then a lot of times this site is more for illustration. Um, I don't know which is better to have you down like that so you can see both or see one page at a time or to be able to see both pages uh okay I've got a question do you have a tip on how to start with FTN I bought in 2021 and haven't started it I do have a tip let me flip for a second and we'll chat about it um the easiest like if you really feel like you need a lot of guidance is to take a course uh the next course open the enrollment starts in March 1st and that it's called the FTN Masterclass, and we're really, that's all we're going to do. We're just going to walk 
from absolute, absolute getting started step one all the way to having a completed book. That's the point of the course. If you're going to get started on your own, I always say to start with the index and fill in as many people as you can. You know, so you pick one person to start your family tree. In this case, this is the book for my mother and she's the root person. And then I filled in as many names as I knew. That will give each person that you know a set index number, and then you can start putting in pages with the information that you've collected for those people using their index number. And just putting in names that you know and then putting the information you've already collected into pages and putting them together, you know, in numerical order, that's going to build a basic book pretty quickly. And then, um, then from there, then you just, do more research and you flesh out the book um, over time. And so if you absolutely don't know anyone, I don't think that there's anybody that I have worked with who uses Family Tree Books pages who absolutely doesn't know the names of any family. That would be very difficult. Even if you can only name four or five people, that's enough to get a book started. Um, so yeah, I always say start with the index and then using those people's index number you know, let's say somebody now has an index number and you have a couple photos of them or you found a marriage record or something. You don't have to build the chapters in order. You just have to take the information that you have, use appropriate pages. And um, for example, building my great grandmother's chapter, I could have started with the orphanage page if that's what I had known about her. And this index number would have tied it together because it's with all of the other pages that use her same index number. Um, I mean, it's kind of like cooking. People that you share the book with are going to see the finished product. They're not going to see your process. So do it in whatever order you need to. And uh, it'll just sort of build itself. Anyway, if anybody has any opinions about whether or not you want to see two pages at once or just one page, let me know. I'm going to keep doing one page at once. Okay, so here we've got a census page. Uh, okay, second question. Uh, are you able to change the root person at a later date? Yes, it's only complicated because changing the root person changes the index numbers for everybody. Um, but if you have the pages completed for people, all you need to do is then go through and then just erase the index number in the bottom corner. Uh, I have done books. Well, I don't, did I bring one up? No. Um, so the index only goes to fourth grade grandparents. So I have done books where somebody is a fourth grade grandparent in one book. And then I make a new book where that person is a root person so that I can continue that family line. So they end up being um, in two different books with two different numbers. That's the only time that I've really messed around with root numbers. I mean, I, I had a very clear sense of whose family tree books I wanted to build. And I was thinking not necessarily for my organization, but like, for who I was going to share it with. So my mother's book can be shared with her siblings and it can be easily, you know, cut in half and then shared with cousins who only, you know, want one side of my mother's family. Um, Same, so my father's book can be shared with siblings. It's just, that's just how I organize them. Okay, so index, or sorry, index, census spread. I've got the image on one side and then the worksheet on the other. And I like to do an image of the full census page and then I always zoom in because it's it's I've got a nice printer but once you print it out it is a little tough to read you know the little micro print of the census so I like to just and usually I <clears throat> enlarge the whole household um the reason that my grandmother is the only person on this line is because this is the census page for the orphanage so I didn't necessarily need the names of everybody else who was on the same page from the orphanage. Um, okay, I've got marriage records and we've got courtship records. These are excerpts from an interview that one of her children did about how his parents met and fell in love and then some early photos of my great grandparents. And then we have marriage records. Um, so Growing up with Chinese foster parents and then being forced to go to a Chinese orphanage because she didn't speak English, it's not a surprise that my white great-grandmother grew up and married a Chinese man. Um, unfortunately, because of the laws of California that 
made it illegal for white women to marry Chinese men at the time. Um, they had to cross state lines. The weird thing is it was also illegal in Nevada, but um, apparently it wasn't as enforced. So, And then we've got marriage records. For a long time, I thought they just didn't get married, but they were married in Nevada. Um, and then sister-in-law, who was a very prominent person in my great-grandmother's life. This is my great-grandmother and her sister-in-law. And they actually knew each other because they were at the orphanage together and they grew up and married brothers. And both of the brothers died relatively young and they spent the rest of their lives um, raising their children together and kind of being a family. So, but yeah, this is them young at the orphanage in their little uniforms. And then this is them when they were older. Um, and then just photos of my family. We've got the 1930 census. Here you can see that the enlargement includes her husband and um, their children. It's actually, so it's different households. This is the sister-in-law. In the fishing village that they lived, they all kind of lived together, but they lived in these little like shacks. So it's three different households, but um, unfortunately, my great grandmother had a drinking problem and didn't live with like technically live with her kids a lot. But they all lived in the same little area. 1940 census. And then the 1950 census. I'm always so excited to see this. It was so fun to add it. Um, residences. There weren't many, but these are uh, to the foster homes and then the orphanage. And then uh, she lived at China Camp, which is now a state park in San Rafael. Um, more information about China Camp. She kind of became this larger in life person and she was featured in the newspaper a lot because she was this short, fat, cigar smoking, beer drinking woman who had a very loose grasp on whether or not people had any authority over her. Um, but she was also fierce about defending her Chinese ident identity, even though racially she wasn't Chinese. She spoke fluent Chinese and believed strongly that Chinese people were better than white people. <laughs> um, she was a terrible... Oh, this is when she tried to shoot my great-grandfather. Again, she was a complicated woman. Uh, this is when she was running into things because she drank too much. So... Colorful history. Uh, this is a famous artist that she was friends with. He made her this little birthday card. And these are clippings about his work. Um, and then her death records. She is buried not next to her husband, but next to her sister-in-law. And then I've got my source citations, which I keep at the back. This is her husband, my great-grandfather. Um who by all accounts was a very, very kind man. Prone to philandering, but very kind. This is the timeline. I love to have a timeline for each ancestor because it helps me see the gaps that I haven't filled in yet. Um, end of his timeline. And then here's a, a page for his parents. They each have their own chapter, but I like to just throw in a parent's page just to sort of round out each person's individual chapter. This is his brother. He had the one brother and he died fairly young, but um, so I have information about his passing. He died of tuberculosis when his kids were babies. Uh, census pages, more census pages. It's very hard to track Chinese names because they spell them terribly and Chinese people go by different names. They have like a, a married name and a milk name and a business name. And so it's very nice that I have managed to find him in the census because it was kind of a pain. Um, 1920 census, 1930 census, which yes, the 1930 census is already in Grace's chapter, but it's a record that includes Henry. And this worksheet is then filled out for Henry's information, whereas Grace has a, a worksheet that's filled out with Grace's information. So not only does it make sense for us for a second, um, Okay, it looks like you guys are still watching, so I think this is going okay. If you're having any problems hearing or seeing what I'm sharing, um, let me know. Uh, thank you. I'm glad you're enjoying it. Okay. 
Maybe my phone just got tired. <laughs> it's like, wow, you've been talking for a long time. Uh, okay, another census page for the 1940 census. Um, here we have more people that have snuck in. Here, let me switch off my Wi-Fi really quick. Okay, maybe that'll be more stable. People who weren't related who kind of snuck in. So this is my great-grandfather living with his... It's listed here with his wife and kids. This is his sister-in-law. And then... Um, We've got another person who has snuck in who uh, was just sort of living among them who isn't related. And then this is my Auntie Jet, who's actually, she's the last person in this family. She's still at China Camp. If you go, if you're in the California area and you go to San Rafael China Camp on Saturdays and you go to the little shop and there's a woman there who will sell you a sandwich or a Coke or a t-shirt, um, that is my Auntie Jet. She's 96 now. Um, but yeah, here she is with her sister. And then this is the grandmother, Mary, who was actually named Yisi, but the white people couldn't handle that. Uh, question, where does your surname come from? I'm related to the Morgan surname. I married into it. And do I have that book? I don't have that book. It's my husband's family. Um, I am one of those people who changed her name when she got married. Okay, so then we've got the World War II draft card for my great-grandfather. Uh, he was 48 when this draft card happened, so he never saw service. But he, living in the village in California, uh, he served in the Navy and served in the Pacific. And more images of the World War II draft card. The draft card has a reverse side. You always want to make sure that you include that and that you don't miss it because it has um, interesting information. Okay. Uh, then we've just got little clippings about his business, um, the fishing business. There were a lot of racist laws that affected the fishing because the Chinese people were very effective at fishing. And so they passed laws saying that you couldn't use certain kinds of nets because they were taking up all the fish. They weren't actually taking up all the fish. The thing that would eventually kind of kill fishing in the bay wasn't overfishing. It was the fact that they rerouted the water and made it too salty and for all the farmers. Um, but at the time, the white fishermen didn't like how many more fish the Chinese people were catching and they passed all sorts of laws. And from what I can tell in the paper, my great grandfather ignored all of them and occasionally got arrested because <laughs> why wouldn't you? Uh, here he is doing whatever he wants to catch as many shrimp as he wants. But again, apparently a very nice guy. Uh, images of China camp, not exactly a booming metropolis, but very comfortable for those of us who wanted to live in a Chinese shrimp village. Um, a little, and people started to see it as like a tourism spot. So they made these pages about it. This is actually my grandma holding a shrimp net, uh, being just the cutest little potato I've ever seen in my life. But yeah, more on that. Um, then we've got liquor licenses and weird side businesses. Um, there was a lot of bootlegging and situations like that that were happening during the war. My great grandparents were very enterprising. Um, then there was a, a slot machine situation. This is my great grandfather getting arrested for that. And then you have his death. He did not die as young as his brother, but he still died at 55. So he died relatively young. And this is when he left his wife. And then she spent the rest of her life living with the sister-in-law. It's because he passed away at 55. And then we have his source citations. Okay, moving on. This is the other side. This is my um, grandfather's family. So this is his mother. Um, and she... It's very young. Is your husband from the UK? It is a Welsh name in the UK. Yes, his family is originally from the UK. Uh, more photos. This is a photo of my great grandmother, my grandmother, my mother, and me. Um, and she passed when I was a year old. Her timeline. Um, she got married and immigrated at just 19 from China. I know absolutely nothing about her life before. Well, I know her family structure and you'll see why in a second. Um, she lived a long time. I don't have a lot filled in, not because I don't know where she was, but because she was really just keeping her head down and working. 
her husband died young as well. Uh, information about her parents. I do have this one photo of her father, but I don't have other information about her parents. And I know that she had two sisters and a brother, but I don't know their names. Um, and then we have lots of immigration records because uh, my great grandmother came through Angel Island off of San Francisco at the time when they were holding and interrogating the Chinese people that were coming in because of the racist anti-immigration laws. And so she had to submit tons of paperwork. This is her and her husband that she knew for like three days before they got on the boat. And then you've got different affidavits from people saying that she's healthy or saying that she is who she is. This is the boat that brought her over. And then while she was held, um, she had to do lots of examinations and interrogations. This is Angel Island. This is where she would have been held and examined. Um, and so you've got, this is just some information about Angel Island. And then you have the beginnings here of the um, interrogation. And she is answering questions as best she can while they decide whether or not they're going to send her back to China. Um, this is poetry that it's not that she wrote it. It's, it was carved into the walls of the cell at Angel Island. So we don't know who wrote it. Um, it just talks about how lonely they are and how scared they are. Um, but I think it's very beautiful. Uh, more paperwork. More paperwork. And then this is the application receipt for her certificate of identity. This is after she was admitted. The nice thing is, I mean, at first I thought, man, that American diet like really affected her because let me find, uh, I've lost her initial for heaven's sakes. Okay. So if you look, this is this photo of her from, that was taken like in China right before she left, right? And affixed to her paperwork. And then you go down to her certificate of identity and like her face is much fuller. And I thought, wow, you know, she really got here and started eating. Um, she got pregnant on the boat. <laughs> so she didn't know him for more than a few days, but they got to know each other. And she had uh, my grandpa's oldest sister, not just, not that long after she was ident or she was uh, admitted. And then we have um, a photo family tree. This is her with her husband. Um, this is my grandfather here. And this is a family photo of them. I, I know about her work. I haven't added stuff in yet. Um, census image. And I went ahead and just tacked this family photo that would have fit this size family at the time. Um, again, this is, let's see. Uh, this is my grandfather. I'm trying to think like, okay, who's, you know, who's who? Census information. Um, this is the 1940 census and the 1950 census. And then her naturalization information. Once she was naturalized, she was naturalized when her children were adults. Um, it takes a long time. <clears throat> this is the original petition for naturalization. And then I've got her death records, images of where she is buried and an obituary. I need to do the source citations for her. Uh, this is her husband, my great grandfather, my father, my grandfather's dad and images of him. Um, very handsome man. And his timeline, so his timeline only reaches from um, birth until he's 43. Unfortunately, he committed suicide. And I have some records about that that haven't made it into this printed book yet. Um, this is his immigration record. So this photo is actually his immigration stamp photo, this one. And I used the photo filtering software on my heritage to sharpen and colorize it. There's, this is like a ongoing thing about, um, it's sort of like a mixed opinion thing. There are people who think you should never do that because it's not an accurate historical representation. And like my descendants are going to be like, well, where's the colored version of this photo? And you shouldn't sharpen it because then you lose, you know, the honesty. Um, I, I actually like occasionally throwing in, 
edited photos that I feel like make the pages more attractive, especially, you know, my, my family is willing to look at the family books. They just don't want to do the research. And so, um, I'm fine throwing in photos like this, uh, especially if I have a copy of the original, which I do right here. Um, but I don't know. I, I would like to know your opinion on whether or not it's dishonest to use modern photo editing uh, to enhance oh, historical photos um, or if we should just leave them alone. OK, so his immigration paperwork, he came over at the same time. And so his father was actually an American citizen who had been born in America, which is unusual. Um, to have a Chinese man who was born in America and was able to bring his family over. And this is after the big earthquake when paper suns were a problem. Paper suns is the term that refers to the fact that there was a big earthquake in 1906 in California and they lost everybody's birth records. And so then you had a lot of Chinese people who had not been born in America saying that they had been born in America. And then you had people who had been born in America who brought people over from China who weren't related to them for money because that was like the only way to immigrate. Um, so it's one of those things where you're like, oh, it's it's sort of embarrassing that my family went around the law. But then you think about it and you're like, they went around the law because the law was awful. Uh, anyway, but he truly is the biological son of this person who was born in America. So my family's actually not descended from paper sons. Um, but there were paper sons that were involved. And you'll see a little bit more of that in his father's uh, chapter. This is his first wife who died in China in childbirth or shortly after childbirth. My great grandmother had no idea that she existed. And in the interrogation, they ask her repeatedly about the first wife. And she's like, I don't know what you're talking about. My husband's never been married before. And he totally was married and just didn't tell her. So... That must have been an awkward conversation when that came out. Or maybe they never talked about it. I don't know. So she's the second spouse. And here is, again, a colorized image of the two of them. Uh, that same family photo. And then he had a truck that he sold vegetables out of. So that's him with his work truck. And here he is in the 1930 census and in the 1940 census. And he does not have a 1950 census because he did not live that long. Um, this is where he is buried and some basic death information. I do have paperwork about from the coroner about his suicide. I just haven't included it yet. Or his source citations. Again, unfortunately, in the digital book I have, this is actually all filled in. I just haven't taken the time to print it out. So do what I say, not what I do, being a bad genealogist. Going back to the other side of the family, this is the, uh, this is Yi Si, and I actually have, um, if you can see right there, that is her portrait. That's a bubble portrait that used to hang in my grandmother's house, and it's in my house for now. Um, but that's this person. And she was born in China and brought over. She was tiny. Look at her compared to this car. Um, tiny, but very fierce, and she lived a long time. And she was another resident of China camp. And again, I have no information about her life between her birth and then her marriage. And then I've got, you know, this son was born, this son was born. But she is occasionally mentioned in the newspaper later in life. I have nothing for her immigration records. I have reason to believe that she was brought over and then auctioned off, um, which happened a lot for people who needed wives or who needed people for brothels. Um, I need to write that up and include that in her chapter. Okay, so census information, the 1900s. Um, this is the 1910 census and the 1920 census and the 1930 census. I do include all the censuses together. Um, I don't break them up, you know, for events that happen between censuses just because I think it's easier to flip through that way. Um, but her chapter doesn't have much else. So then we've got death records. She's actually buried. It says George C. in the Nisi. This is not her husband. This is her son who died young of tuberculosis. Her husband, you'll see in his chapter, dies in uh, San Francisco. And then he's actually taken to a um, cemetery 
that was south of San Francisco, it would have been a very long, very difficult journey for Yi Si to go down and visit his grave, especially since this all happens before the Golden Gate Bridge. And she's on the other side of where the Golden Gate Bridge now connects into the city. Um, the reason for that was that it was already illegal to, well, it was, they were tightening the restrictions on who could be buried in San Francisco anyways, but it was illegal specifically for Chinese people to be buried in San Francisco. And so he was taken to a Chinese cemetery south of San Francisco. And I don't know. I don't know if she ever saw his grave. I don't know. My grandmother had no memories of going all the way down there to see his burial. And I've actually, I haven't been able to figure out which headstone is his because all of the um, headstones in that cemetery are in Chinese, which I can't read. But yeah, so she is, my whole family is just kind of confusing because you would think that my great grandparents would have been buried together and that their, you know, his parents would have been buried together. And instead she's buried with her son, which left my aunt who was married to this son, not either. She would have been not buried with anybody, but then she ended up being buried next to my great grandmother. And then it's my great grandfather who sort of ended up being buried somewhere else. There's also a, um, a baby that's buried in the cemetery. That's not anywhere near them. Anyway, little article about, Grandma Quan Si, people were familiar with her, and more source citations I haven't printed out. Okay, so this is her husband, who was a merchant in his timeline, which is, you know, again, fairly empty. Family photo of the two of them with their two sons. And he was able to have a certificate of residence. This is the paperwork that allowed Chinese people to live and work in America. So he would have had to carry this to prove that he was allowed to be there. Um, it was mostly given to people who were able to do something, I don't know, interesting, something that was considered more significant. So he is uh, listed as a person other than laborer, because he was a merchant and an importer. Um, this is kind of a, a horrible thing that he had to carry. And at the same time, it's so nice to have a photo and these like, very clear information about where was he living? Who did he work for? What are his physical marks and stuff like that? So from a genealogy standpoint, this is a wonderful document, but it still makes me sad that he had to carry it. And uh, a closer picture of him. I think he was very handsome. And then I've got a worksheet where I've just um, written out the information. Got the 1900 census, uh, 1910 census. We have occupation records. So in China camp, he ended up having a general store. This is him with people who were coming to visit the general store. You can see this little sign up here, the Yikyuan Chinese store in China camp. So you've got all these people who would come out, you know, for the weekend and they're taking pictures in front of the Chinese store. And then this is a photo of him with his pipe in front of the store. And I don't know where the original photo is. So this is the best image I've got. I would love to find this photo, but I don't know who has it. Um, more images of China camp during his life when it was truly a very humble little fishing village. And then we've got his death records and this is the Chinese cemetery where he is buried in San Mateo um, after he died in San Francisco. And the mortuary records um, of Chinese decedents because the Chinese records are held differently than regular mortuary records. <clears throat> and his blank source citations page. I have a page here for Shiju, which is my um, great grandmother's mother, but I don't have any information about her. So it's really just a placeholder. And then I've got this one photo of her father, um, but that's all I have. And then we've got, this is, we're switching back to the other side of the family that was coming through Angel Island. This is the mother who was also from China and immigrated when she was older. Um, and you can see I've taken these original photos and then used um, the MyHeritage photo filters to colorize them and sharpen them up a little bit. Um, her immigration records, so she's immigrating to join her husband. And they, she still had to go through everything, but... Um, I actually, if you look at the transcript, I think they were easier on her. And I don't know if they were easier on her because she was an established wife, which was a lot less common than a paper son, or because she was just a bazillion years old and she was probably three foot nothing. And so, or maybe she, I mean, she has that face. Maybe she just didn't want to 
listen to them and they didn't want to talk to her either. Uh, 1930 census after, of course, they let her in. She doesn't naturalize. Um, she lives for a while, but she doesn't naturalize. And then we've got her death records. And uh, I actually was able to visit her grave in October for the first time. Uh, and I've got more pictures, but I haven't included them. Okay, so then we've got her husband who was born in America. And that was very lucky for lots of people. So here's a picture of him, Song. Um, he lived with my grandfather for a long time until my grandfather was a very young adult. And apparently he was a very nice person. And here's a little snapshot of him when he's much older. But he was born in America and went back and forth a couple of times. So I have a lot of immigration paperwork for him. Um, but this is information about his father and his family. I don't have photos. And then I just have these pages for sibling profile because I have information about the siblings, even though I don't have photos. Um, so I've got information about their names. These are all the children that would have been born in America and some back and forth travel information. And then I've got, uh, these letters that had to be written that, you know, basically say, yes, I know him. He is not lying. He is you know, he was born here. I know the family. And these are from 1899. So these are before the earthquake. Um, so this is before Paper Sons. This is just a transcription of the letter. And, oh, okay. I got a, a comment. Thanks for mentioning you keep the census records together instead of putting other events in between. That's something I've struggled with. You know, I used to put other events in between and it just made it messy. So yeah, I hope that helps. Again, totally personal preference, but Anyway, so yeah, I have all this paperwork, which actually proves that he's not a paper son because this predates uh, paper son happenings. Um, but yeah, every time he came back and forth, America was like, no, who are you? Prove yourself. Even though every other person who came back and forth could stumble off the boat and go home. <sighs> not that I'm bitter. Um these are interviews of interrogation where he's going to Angel Island to be interrogated on behalf of his family who's trying to immigrate. So they weren't holding him, but they were still interrogating him to make sure that everybody's um, stories lined up. He did try to import some paper sons and daughters. Some of them were successful and some of them were not. Uh, I'm not going to linger on this too much because some people kind of find it to be a source of just whatever, that they're descended from a paper son and daughter, but it did happen. And I do have some of their information in our book um, because it is part of the story. Uh, 1930 U.S. Census and um, more paperwork about just, I think this is actually, so this is in the 30s. Um, this is where he's trying to find like a birth certificate or something because, you know, shocker, there weren't a lot of birth records for Chinese people who were born in America. They weren't able to issue a birth certificate, but they were able to say, look, we have these letters, so we're not going to deport you. You're also really old. I mean, they don't exactly say that, but they kind of say that. And then he's in the 1940 census and he passes away uh, in 1952. So he's actually in the 1950 census, but I haven't printed it out yet. And I have that photo of him by the car and I've blown it up and added color just because, again, I feel like it draws you in more. And I added that to his obituary. Okay, and then these ones are actually very slim little, oh, I'm sorry, it keeps getting blurry. I think it, it's trying to like show you my hand. You guys are getting really clear images of my hand every five seconds. Um, anyways, I have this ancestor. This is the first ancestor in my family who came to America. Um, and he came in 1858 and he worked in a mining village. Uh and so I have very basic information, but I haven't found a ton. I do have this letter from somebody who knew him that talks about how he knew him and he knows him as being this person who lived in this place and did this thing. And yeah, that's my first immigrant ancestor and that's out of my family. And that is that book. It's 1040. That actually, that took a lot longer than I thought. I'm going to switch to one of the white sides of my family now, but while we've got a little bit of a break, are there any other questions from people who are who have joined us. We've talked a little bit about organization. Should I show this side or the other? This one needs to be updated, but maybe I'll show this side because it's still one of the books where I only have information on one 
side because I haven't turned it into a double page spread so then I won't have to switch you back and forth on the off chance that there was anybody who was getting a little seasick. Um, the other thing about this book is that I don't have tabs in it because I need to switch it out. I actually pulled the tabs off. Um, so give me a second while I get away from the living people. Um, can't share information about living people on the internet. That is wrong, wrong, wrong. Okay. All right. So this is, yeah, like I said, this is a book that digitally has, it doesn't look anything like this now, but this is the printed version that I took a long time ago to a family function. And we've got a 1900 census and then the census image follows. You can see how if I was able to put the census image here, which I have now, that just reads a lot better. And of course it doesn't use up as much paper. Uh, the colorized photos show more details. Love the colorized photos, especially with them next to the black and white photo. I agree. So thank you for backing me up. I just feel like it, um, it adds a little something. I don't know if I should add a notation saying that I colorized it. I mean, I could, I just never have. 1910 census. 1940 census. You can see I lost her for a bit there. And then death records, we've got an obituary that I shrunk down. Um, yeah, this book needs to be updated. Then we have her husband. This is not uh, biologically my side of the family. This is part of my husband's family. So I know less about these people um, than I do about all of the scandals of my family. Um, <laughs> my husband's family lived uh, relatively, I don't want to say normal, but the events that happen in their life are like, oh, they, they got a promotion. They visited their child. They moved to a new cabin. Whereas my family, it's like, they got arrested. They shot somebody. They were part of a citywide scandal. So I actually like having both. It's a lot easier to research my husband's family because they show up in the paper just in totally normal, <laughs> expected ways. And they're in the paper often. So that's nice. Okay, this is an ancestor who died in a tuberculosis sanatorium, and I've been trying to get those records for a long time. I have not succeeded. Funny story, my husband grew up with this photo on his wall. We had been married at least three years, and I knew my husband for a long time before that, before one day I was walking down the hall and with him, and I said, okay, you've never told me, but who are these people? And he looks at it, and he's like, I don't know. I think that's just a decoration. Yeah, it's not a decoration, you guys. It's a family photo. I asked his mom and she was like, oh, I think that's part of my family. And then we flipped it over and there's this like beautiful typed out, this is who everybody is thing. And it's totally his family. They had been just walking by it like it was art at Cracker Barrel. Uh, I thought that was really funny and cute. Uh, my husband will get into genealogy, but only if I've digested it and put it into pages like this for him. He just does not want to do the research. He'll also humor me if I talk about it for a long time, but it's not his thing. Anyway, I've got profiles for each of the siblings. There were a ton of siblings. A lot of their photos come from that group photo. Um, there's different siblings pages because there were different parents. So I've got these siblings pages where they're all grouped together, and then I divide it down into specific sibling profiles. But you can see there were a lot of siblings. Not a ton to do in... Uh, West Virginia. Although they were like farmers and miners, so in West Virginia, so maybe they just needed the help. A lot of them lived for a long time and a lot of them never left West Virginia. So it's just funny. It's like my husband and I actually met at Disney World. Uh, and so you've got somebody from Pacific, California, Chinese roots, and somebody from a combination of Deep South and then West Virginia roots. And we got married. Now our kids have this family tree that's just completely chaotic. Um, Morgan says, I put all of the children with the mother and include information about them. That makes sense. I like to do siblings because I like to keep the generations on the same line, but it doesn't actually... 
I mean, it doesn't, as long as you just pick one system and stick with it so you don't make yourself crazy, I think that that works. Um, this is somebody who, he's a draft evader for the First World War. It's kind of sad, though. He's a draft evader after his brother dies in World War One, And then, you know, that probably didn't seem like a good idea when your older brother went overseas and didn't come back. More sibling pages. I love this juxtaposition of her as this cute little toddler and then this, you know, not. And then, okay, we've got the 1880 census and some marriage records. And these children both passed away in infancy. And then we've got the 1900 census. Um, this is the first husband. And then we've got marriage records for the second husband, which is who my uh, husband is descended from. And then her death records um, in Pitcairn, Pennsylvania, from pulmonary tuberculosis. So that's the sanitarium records I'm trying to get. We've got the actual death record. And then we've got these bonds where legally her husband was forced to acknowledge the children that he would take care of them. I thought that this was really weird and I wondered if like their paternity was in question, but then looking into it, um, apparently this just happened all the time that even though he was established as their father, because the mother died, they had to like make sure that he really knew he had to take care of his kids, which is kind of sad, but I guess was just normal. Um, anyway, that's what these documents are. This is her husband which is her second husband and the one that she had living children with. Um, these pages are a little more stuck together. The 1900 census and the image. And then here we've got, um, he has different wives. So um, that's why there's different census thing. Sorry. I, I had a total, uh, my brain melted for a second. I'm tracking him across census pages and the, the people in his household change to show the different children. And when they're leaving, this helps me track, okay, did a child disappear before they should have? And also who is listed as his wife? Um, he has children with his wife, Amanda, who is who my, um, my husband is descended from. And then he married a woman named Evelina and had um, other children from her. So the Evelina is, you know, in the census as the wife, but she is not the biological, um, mother of most of these children. But then at this point, um, so Lenore is the last child of Amanda. And then from Violet forward, these are, um, children of Evelina, if that makes sense. So the, the census page just kind of helps me. And this is actually, this is one of the early versions. If you'll notice, this isn't what the census comparison page looks like now. This is because I used to just make these basic tables. Death records. This is his will and testament. Um, and then ancestor profiles. And we've got another very basic um, page about John Killian, who was married to Mary Killian. And then all of the different children. And then the fact that her death is indicated because she's absent in the 1930 census and he's listed as a widower. Not a ton of information about her otherwise and no photos. Killian. And then the certificate of death. Her husband. And his obituary. <laughs> it's a very short chapter. I have more on him. It's just in my digital thing. Sorry. Uh, it kind of struck me off, off guard. <laughs> he was born and then he died. Uh, okay. And then we've got the Runkles. Um, and the More Hearts. I have a lot more in this family. It's just not in this book. I really need to sit down and print these things out. This is just him talking about, he's not dead yet, but this is his seriously ill. So um, I have it on this newspaper excerpt. I, I would use a different page for that now. And then Samuel Tolomer, who is uh, one of the people in that big group photo. This is a ver another very basic early census comparison, tracking his children across censuses. Um, 
see, Margaret Harris. I think back here, do I just have names? Yeah, I have information about these people that I haven't printed out. Um, the Westovers of Pennsylvania. And then here we've got some Civil War records, which again, I have very basic printouts, but I would use different pages for these now. Um, Mary Magdalena Ware. These are all people who are just in Ohio, in Ohio, Ohio, Ohio for a very long time. And we're getting back into things where I have other people's written family histories. These are not to be taken as like, okay, this is absolutely what happened, but these are great clues that will help you then find other records so that you can verify their facts. And we've got more hearts. I wish I had a better photo of this. That was taken from somebody's ancestry upload. Um, I'm sorry, these are so blank. You can see I found tons of people and I haven't filled in their chapters, but they're, these are just holding spaces for people with their index numbers. So again, this is like a, a book in progress. This exact copy I actually printed out in a hurry and took up when we were visiting this part of my family. Um, that's why I have more that didn't make it into this book. But again, I need to be better about printing things off. This is kind of interesting. This is Lydia Roller and some basic information. And then Christian Moorhart. Christian Moorhart, Moorhart was relatively notorious, not notorious, relatively famous in this place in Ohio because he built something called the Rock Mill. Um, which is in Lancaster, Ohio. And they, it's still there. Like you can still visit it. I've never actually been there. It's annoying because I got my law degree in Columbus and that was before I really got into my husband's genealogy because we weren't married. And so I would have been 40 minutes away from this and I never went and visited. And we, every time we go back, we go to Akron, which is nowhere near Lancaster. So I need to go at some point. But I have all of these um, articles about the rock mill because that's his family. This is that, you know, the photo that I'm using. I would love to get a better photo. And then we're back to really early ancestor things that need to be fleshed out more. Um, and they just haven't been. So maybe this is just to show you that you can have all the pages and you still need to actually sit down and do the work. I have been sleeping on this book and just not, not filling it out. Okay, back to 1758. See, a lot of these are just other people's family history work, but I now need, like that, the task falls to me to back it up. So this is included in the chapter, but you have to, um, you have to flesh it out with real, real records. Okay. And I think, yeah, we're it. So let me flip this around. Oh, or let me just zoom in on part of the table. There we go. Okay, well, it's 1054. I brought another book, but obviously we're not going to have time to get into it. I didn't realize that the flip throughs were going to take that long. So in the last five minutes, if anybody has any other questions, um, I am happy to answer them. I don't have, oh, I do have, there's only a few of you on that are live right now, but I do have um, a little hint. I didn't know when to like say this, but be sure that you are on my email list, um, which you, you have to go to familytreenotebooks.com and sign up. And it's like, if you get any of the freebies or any of the free downloads, then you join the email list, um, which you just scroll down and you'll see the free downloads that you can get. Uh, you're going to want to be on the email list for next week because I have something exciting happening. Uh, something that I never, ever do. A little, I'm not going to tell you what, because it's not time yet, but what kind of covers do you use for the books? Are all three of these. So these are just cheap covers um, that I get off of Amazon. And this is the brand. And you get them in packs of five. So, um, yeah. And all, all of these are the same, the same brand. And then the 
uh, discs that I use, I don't know if you guys can see, are this TUL brand. Can you see the logo? That's really, there we go. Can you see that TUL? Um, which are also from Amazon. Uh, I have a Levenger hole punch and I have some books that I use like Levenger covers. Levenger is really expensive, but I got a Levenger hole punch because of how often I use the hole punch and I wanted it to hold up. And so I have like a leather Levenger cover and I have this other one that looks like marble. They're really, really nice. Um, they're just pricey and I got to the point where one, I have a ton of disbound books. I have one for our family finances. I've got one for my business. I've got one for each course I've ever taught. Um, I have one that holds like records for our kids. So I needed to downgrade to cheaper covers. And then for my family trees, I wanted the covers to be very, I wanted them to be similar, but I wanted them to be very distinct by color. Um, and the, these are cheap covers, but they're very, very durable. And they're, you know, like you can spill on them. I wouldn't want to, but you can. Um, and they've held up beautifully. Whereas my one of my leather lavender covers that I use for something else, it's actually a little bit scuffed because why wouldn't it be? Um, so yeah, I would, I mean, if you have the money, there are disc bound brands that are pricier and maybe more attractive. But again, I think that these are just fine. Uh, this this book has one inch discs that I bought at Staples and it actually doesn't have the brand name on them. And then this book, which is the, this is the, oh, we didn't look at this one, but this is one of the double-sided ones. So it's thinner. Um, it has that cheap cover that I just showed you. And then these discs are actually from the company Happy Planner. And so they're smaller and you can see they're just kind of glittery. I've been experimenting with wanting to get different colored discs because that way when they're stacked together, um, it'll be even more obvious which book is which book. Um, the problem is that for the Happy Planner discs, this is as large as they get. And so um, right now all the rest of mine are just black. I do have, I have little tiny discs that are blue and white and things like that. I just haven't been able to find them in bigger sizes, so. Okay. All right. Well, we are basically at time. Um, it's been fun chatting with you guys. I am going to be on TikTok next week for the first time. We'll have to see how that goes. And I, I think I might have it be at a different time so that we're not only switching up the platforms that I'm going live on to let everybody have a chance to visit on the live, um, but also to give people who live in different places or have different schedules a chance. So um, that's also going to be in the email next week. I'll have a link to where you can find me live and a time for when that's going to happen, but it will be next Friday. Um, the email next week is going to be really exciting. So again, if you're on my email list, join it because yeah, I love, um, I love it when the email is exciting. All right. Thank you guys for joining me. It was fun to talk to you and I will talk to you soon.